Hello, and welcome to today's ACM Tech Talk. This webcast is part of ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and professional development, serving a global membership of computing professionals and students. I'm Dr. Bradley Jensen, a principal data scientist and architect in the data and analytics division at Eccentric Consulting. I'm also president of the board of directors for the Institute for Certification of Computing Professionals and a member of the ACM Professional Development Committee. For more on my background, check out the bio widget that's on your screen. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with ACM or what it has to offer, here is some additional information. ACM offers educational and professional development resources that bolster, that bolster skills and enhance career opportunities. Our members can stay competitive in the constantly changing world of computing with a wide range of ACM Learning Center resources at learning.acm.org. You can see some of the highlights on your screen. ACM also recognizes the role of computing in driving innovations that sustain competitiveness in a global environment. ACM provides things like access to the ACM Digital Library, which is the world's most comprehensive database of computing literature, leading publications and global conferences that draw top experts on a broad spectrum of computing topics, support for education and research, including curriculum development, teacher training, the ACM Turing and ACM Prize in Computing Words, Awards, excuse me, and the ACM Code of Ethics, a collection of principles and guidelines that, that are designed to help computing professionals make ethically responsible decisions in professional practice. ACM also enables its members to solve critical problems using new technology that enriches our lives and advances our social society in the digital age. Now, before we get started, I'd like to quickly mention a few of our housekeeping items that are shown on the slide in front of you. If you are experiencing any problems with the slides or audio, refresh your browser or close and relaunch the presentation. If you have questions during this talk, please type them into the Q&A box at the time and click the submit button. I'll organize these questions as Scott speaks and we'll try to get as many of them answered as possible after Scott's presentation. Actually, if you do have questions and they're pertinent at the time, I will try and interrupt Scott and get him to answer them at the time. So go ahead and just enter them as you're going through and I will determine if we can answer them then or there later. Session is being recorded and will be archived. You'll receive an automatic email notification after it's done when this becomes available. And you can check learning.acm.org for any updates on this and other upcoming webcasts. Also at the end of this presentation, you'll see a survey open up on your screen. Please take a minute to fill it out so that you can help us improve our tech talks. You may also open the link to the survey at any time from the resources window. You can use the widgets on the bottom panel to share the presentation link with your friends, as well as tweet comments and questions using hashtag ACM Learning. We'll be watching for your tweets. We also have a community discourse page to continue the discussion after this webcast, including questions we won't be able to get through during the Q&A session. Today's presentation is called Running Linux Apps on Windows, How To, how and why, and it's done by Scott Hanselman. So Scott Hanselman is a web developer who has been blogging at HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash Hanselman.com for nearly 20 years. He works in open source on ASP.NET and the Azure cloud for Microsoft out of his home office in Portland, Oregon. Scott has podcasted at HTTP colon forward slash forward slash Hanselminutes.com for nearly 800 episodes over 15 years. He's also written a number of books and has spoken in person to over a half a million developers worldwide. So Scott, without further ado, take it away. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you, sir. We will be uh, trying to answer questions as in real time as possible. Because the great thing about talks like this at the ACM is it's real. This is not a YouTube. It's not a recorded anything. We're really here live and we're here to ask and answer your, we're here to answer your questions. So um, this is me, I'm Scott. Hopefully you'll be able to see that right now. Uh, you can go to Hanselman.com and learn about uh, what I've been doing for a long time. I'm a big fan of blogging. Uh, as uh, Dr. Bradley there you know, mentioned, I have been blogging for 20 plus years. It's a thing that I do because I 
I feel strongly about where my keystrokes go. I think that there's a finite number of keystrokes left in your hands before you die. So when questions come to me, I blog about them. And uh, a lot of the things that I'll be talking about today are available up on the blog. And if you go up to my blog, and I'm just going to scroll while I'm talking here and just show you that the, the benefits of typing in a blog or somewhere where a URL that you own as opposed to putting it in social media uh, is very much something that is additive. Email is where keystrokes go to die. So I just tend to type things up. So if anyone does go and send me any questions, I will go and uh, probably blog about them. Check out the blog for some details. And then one other thing I want to point out is that I have a uh, podcast called Hansel Minutes. And again, 800 plus episodes, including some that we've done in partnership with the ACM. Recently, we had Leslie Lamport on uh, in association and partnership with the ACM Bytecast. So we actually did a podcast and published it in two locations, two locations. So that was pretty cool. So what we're going to talk about today is uh, what's been going on in Windows with the context being Linux specifically. So I'm going to use Notepad here to just give you a little bit of information here. So I happen to be running Windows 11, but the stuff that I'm showing is not specific to Windows uh, 11. Um, Windows 10 can do these things. You can be doing a lot of this stuff right now, okay? You can be doing this stuff right now with Windows. Uh, you'll be able to do more things with Windows 10, which is called Insiders. You can go and sign up for Windows 10 Insiders. That will give you the GUI support that we're going to be discussing. But the thing I'm going to be talking about today, which is WSL, the Windows subsystem for Linux, has been around for a couple of years now and is actually quite mature and is, uh, is released. So that everything I'm talking about is released until I talk about the GUI support, which is called WSLG. Let's back up and get a little bit of context about a few other things that might have uh, you might have missed because uh, some folks that may not be using Windows may not be familiar with some of the things that we've been doing. Um, right now, I am inside of the Windows terminal. And the Windows terminal is a new open source terminal. It's going to be what's called the inbox terminal. It's going to be available in the box. So you'll have the, uh, the Windows terminal available to you in Windows out of the box. And it is uh, a replacement for the original Windows console. And it's important to point out that the Windows console uh, is uh, historically a very old thing. And I'm actually going to go in here and show you a choice where I can set the default terminal application. There's the original Windows console host, and then there's the Windows terminal. And I'm going to show you the difference between them. And then we're going to talk about terminals versus shells. Traditionally, over the last 30 plus years, you've probably thought about this console when you think about uh, Windows. And the uh, layout, the properties dialog box here that comes with the original console host looks like Windows 95. It really hasn't changed in many, many years. Okay, um, And what's going on here is a couple of things. We've got the, the kind of the DOS prompt. It's DOS-like. It's the command prompt. We have the terminal, which is this part. This is the part that is, oops, hang on. I think we've, there we go. This part here, the console host that painted the Chrome, and then the prompt and the shell itself. People tend to conflate these things, and that can be somewhat problematic. We don't want to do that. Having a little bit of a challenge here with the, uh, there we go, with the screen sharing. And I've written a blog about shells, prompts, and terminals. And I just want to make sure that we're clear about that uh, because folks tend to, um, to conflate them. And the blog post is the difference between them. There we go. Historical context here is important because I see in the, in, the, in the comments here, like Michael Brady makes a comment. He says, well, terminal, is that the new command window? Where does PowerShell fit in? This is a great question. This is kind of the classic question. But we have to remember that a console, a terminal, and a shell are all being conflated. Terminal, of course, comes from that original word terminate and then the, the, the terminal end of something. And originally, terminals were typewriters at the end of something, a teletypewriter or a TTY. 
So a terminal might just be some output and some input that's on the terminal end of something. Uh, and then in the context of Windows, a terminal is going to be that software version of the terminal end of something. And then when you put that inside of a console, like this console, uh, that is a different thing. And then the shell of which you have dozens and dozens and dozens of choices is also optional and, uh, and manageable. And then the prompt on top of that can be customized as well. So it's really common to say, well, is this DOS? Is this PowerShell? Is this all of the above? We have to separate the thing that makes the string from the thing that processes and paints the string. So we've got the shell, like PowerShell, like Fish. We've got the prompt that actually printed out the dollar sign or the um, greater than sign. Then we've got the console host that painted stuff. So let's give an example. If I go and type dir slash s, we're going to see a lot of fast text happening really quickly. So we're printing out a directory. And it'll look a little choppy on your side because of the tool that we're using right now. But on the Windows side, that is synchronous. And the, uh, the DOS box, that DOS box is not responsible for painting. It's actually the console host that's doing the painting. And there's 30 years of history there. Um, if I, from this command line, type PowerShell, I'm now running a different shell, but I'm still within the same console window. There are other shells that I could potentially run from the command line. And if I type exit, now I'm back at, 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 at DOS. If I type exit, then this, ex this leaves. If we return back over to Windows Terminal, which is an alternative console host, I can still run the Windows command prompt. I have a different shell. So the command prompt doesn't know that anything's changed. It's still taking strings. It's uh, painting. It's printing out strings, rather. But now a different console host is responsible for actually rendering it. What we get here with an all new console is the benefits of 30 years of of positive history. We've got DirectX, and we've got the ability to paint directly to the screen and paint asynchronously, and I can do hundreds of frames a second. So now suddenly, this, this C++ written free open source terminal is a lot more flexible, a lot more powerful, and supports a lot more stuff. You can see that the menu here, I can also add all these different shells to it. So Windows Terminal is actually a terminal, not a prompt. It's not a replacement shell. Any shell you already have works with it. It may feel that I took a while to get to the point there, but it's important for us to understand the difference between consoles, shells, and terminals. So for example, you might use Python, you might use Anaconda, you might use Bash or Fish or PowerShell or Console or Fordos or whatever. All of them will work here, and they'll all work just fine. It just needs to be set up as a potential prompt. So for example, I was doing a talk recently and a gentleman named Jack said he wanted to use the Python prompt. So I added Python here custom as a menu item. And all that's going to do when I click on it is run Python. And Python is a console app that returns a string and takes a string, right? And outputs it. And it doesn't know that the Windows terminal is doing that work there. Okay, and that's allowing us a lot of flexibility. I could additionally fill this menu up with uh, endpoints that I can SSH into. I can use things like Git Bash or Mono and things like that. We're going to talk about WLinux and uh, Ubuntu and all those things as well. And then additional custom prompts that I may have set up with my own environment variables, I'll have uh, as well. Okay. So uh, the console and the terminal, they seem to be identical. This is a great point. So let's just bring them up next to each other to make sure that we're clear. Again, even Microsoft is conflating the words sometimes. And uh, it's easy for even me to make that mistake. So if I go and bring up the original console, you're going to see two black windows. Here's the console host, and here's Windows Terminal. This console host is responsible for painting this area here. It's responsible for font rendering, and it's responsible for this dialog box by which I can pick fonts and layouts and things like that. Okay. Over here in the Windows terminal, you might say, oh, it's another black 
square box. But this one can include a lot of customization. You see I put the Ubuntu logo in the corner here. I've got custom colors, fonts, ligatures. There's another logo in the corner. I've got this drop-down menu. This command palette is available. So I can go like this and open up a command palette, much like Visual Studio Code. So it's a lot, lot different. And it's, again, free, open source, and will be coming out of the box uh, as well. This terminal, a question here from uh, Carl from Tulane is saying, does it maintain host state? This terminal doesn't care about those kind of things. So if I were to try to reconnect to an existing uh, host, that's up to that host to maintain, uh, maintain that state. This terminal is very old, very simple. It will be replaced. And that's that option that I set, which will be available in the future, to go and say, what is the default terminal? So at some point in the future, you'll go and say, uh, you know, CMD, and it will open up that command prompt, that shell inside of uh, Windows Terminal for you. Robin Norris is saying almost like uh, a virtual machine. We haven't gotten into virtual machines yet. We're only referring specifically to how terminals work. And there's actually an interesting blog post on pseudo TTY in Windows and what actually happened. And if you go over to, uh, you were, uh, people were asking about charts and graphs. This all started in August of 2018 when we started to acknowledge the limitations of the Windows internals on these things and a background on the evolution of this command line. And at the end of this, there is a discussion of how terminals talk to applications and shells, as well as the specific architecture if you're interested in, uh, in those things. All right. I'm just taking a look at some of the questions, some great questions here. Uh, one of the comments was in the old days, uh, like a few months ago, uh, if you wanted to edit your settings, uh, you had to edit a JSON file. That is uh, still the backing store. So for example, if I go into Visual Studio Code and I look at my JSON file, you can see here the settings for my terminal, like binding control C to copy. Question that we have here from David Drenow is saying, it used to require a JSON file. Yes, it, it used to, but there is now a wonderful settings dialog and you can go and manage appearance and it will serialize to JSON and then you don't actually have to, uh, to look at that. So both JSON is available and uh, the settings are available as well. So you don't have to, uh, to do that. Um, question here if uh, from Carl, updated uh, question. If you load a Python package, switch to Ubuntu and back to Python, is the Python package still loaded? It's up to you to decide if you connected to, like, for example, two Ubuntus at, at once. If I have one Ubuntu and then I have another one split screen, and I, you know, if I do a Python pip over here, yes, as long as they're within the same context, they will be there. But in this Python, I'm in Windows, and this one, I'm in Linux, and I haven't gotten into that yet. Uh, we'll get into this. It sounds like uh, folks are wanting me to get more into the Linux stuff. A lot of questions here about terminal. I wanted to talk about the terminal uh, because it gives you a lot of context into what's going on to um, in Microsoft to get people up to speed on these things. First, how do you get the Windows terminal? Go ahead and Google with it with your favorite search. Google with, Google with DuckDuckGo. Uh, Windows terminal is in the Windows store. You can compile it from source, you can download it from GitHub, and it will eventually be built into Windows and come out of the box. So you can get Windows Terminal anywhere you want. A lot of questions about Windows, WSL. We'll go into WSL and we'll talk about those kind of things. Okay, let's share my screen and let's see if we can answer some of these questions with more demos on this, on this alternate laptop here, okay? Okay, so we were talking about Terminal. Okay, cool, all right. So we, we've talked about how the terminal exists. That is where you want to start. So step one, get Windows Terminal. Uh, step two, you want to install what's called WSL. And WSL is the Windows subsystem for Linux. And what you're going to do is you're going to go to Windows and you're going to type in the start menu features. And you're looking for an option that says turn Windows features on or off. And you're going to get a little dialog box that looks like this. And at the very bottom, there's an option for the Windows subsystem for Linux, and there's an option for the virtual machine platform. This is not Hyper-V, what you think of as Hyper-V. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a thing that Hyper-V is built on top of. So it is using Hyper-V type technologies, but Hyper-V is the ability to run a virtual machine like in a square. 
I don't know if people can see me holding my hands up. This is why I wanted to do things on my on my big desktop. Um, with Hyper-V or Parallels or VirtualBox or VMware, you're running a virtual machine in a square. So you imagine the square of your computer and then the square of the virtual machine. So it's not really integrated. It's more that the virtual machine's running on top of your system. What the Windows subsystem for Linux is right now, specifically what's called WSL version two, is it is a tiny utility VM with the absolute focus being to start up as fast as possible. You wanna be able to start up in just a couple of seconds, not in the like 10, 15, 20 seconds that things take uh, to, to fire up. Now, of course, I'm on a tiny little laptop here also sharing my screen, so it's gonna embarrass me by taking more than two seconds to start up. But hopefully if I don't have any trouble on this computer, which I haven't fired up in a long time, I'm gonna go ahead and bring up Task Manager. There we go. Here's Ubuntu, just started up right there. So here's Ubuntu on this machine running side by side with PowerShell. So here's PowerShell on Windows, here's Ubuntu. And I can go and sudo apt update and sudo apt upgrade and do all the things that I would potentially want to do because it is actually Ubuntu. We are actually shipping a Windows, we're shipping a Linux uh, kernel now with, uh, with Windows. If I open up the task manager, I'm going to move that onto this monitor here and we'll go and sort by memory. You'll see a thing called VM mem. So that's the thing that is managing the utility virtual machine that we just started up right there. So right now it's using about a gig of RAM and that's gonna actually increase and, and, uh, and, and shrink based on the things that I ask it to do. Uh, Brian Ramsey from Berea Calls is asking about WSL1 versus WSL2. If you go to the command line and you say WSL uh, dash dash list dash V, it'll list out the different uh, instances that you have of your Linux, uh, your Linux distros and the version that they are. This gets into some technical stuff, but I know we love that. Let's go ahead and back up a moment and talk about the differences. So WSL is the Windows subsystem for Linux, and what's ironic is that it probably should have been called the Linux subsystem for Windows, but whatever, naming is hard, right? Linux, okay, WSL1 came out a number of years ago. It does not include a Linux kernel. And you can think about it as reverse wine in the sense of if you run a Linux ELF binary on Windows and it makes a system call, Windows will lie and redirect it to a, the Windows kernel. So there is no Linux kernel on WSL1. It's tightly integrated into Windows itself. It also supports the ability to talk to COM ports, uh, which allows WSL1 to really work great for IoT scenarios and doing any kind of work like that, where you're gonna be talking to an external device, okay? WSL2, has a Linux kernel. You can get the source code for it on GitHub. Our Linux kernel's up there. And uh, you can also build your own Linux kernel. This is really, really important because old Microsoft is black boxes and we don't let you do anything. New Microsoft is, it's your computer, have a blast. So if you wanna compile your own Linux kernel, if you wanna create your own school or university specific Linux distro, you can do that. You could uh, make one for your course. You could actually go out and import a Linux kernel, so I can go WSL dash dash help, and there's options for import and export, which are just tarred up user, um, a tar, tar, tars of your user uh, space stuff. And then I could go and export one and say, this is my CS101 class or my operating systems class, and then students could go and import it and be all set to go. So there's a lot of flexibility there. And if you wanna go and hack it and you know mess, up, mess it up and compile your own Linux kernel, knock yourself out. Okay, back to our notepad. Has an actual Linux kernel. Syscalls are syscalls. And this is important because with WSL1, some of the syscalls did not uh, map. So, you know, let, I don't know the number, but let's just say there's a thousand syscalls. There's a lot more. And maybe like, you know, 900 and, or 985 or some number, right? Or, you know, work. And then obscure ones didn't. So we had syscall compatibility issues. And it was like, well, it's not full compatibility. How could it be? 
because we're basically thunking into the Windows kernel. True compatibility is going to happen with a, uh, a Linux kernel. Uh, and then the uh, then things get more interesting when we start thinking about how the file systems work. Because in this case here, if we go and run DF, we can see that we've got you know real Linux file system and then some mount points. So my C drive, my NTFS Windows C drive, in the context of Linux is actually over here on mount. So mount C, right? That's where Windows exists. So then if I went in there looking for my desktop, there's my Windows desktop mounted to my Linux file system, okay? Now here's where it gets weird because some people in the, uh, oh, people are, okay, someone is saying that my credibility is at risk now because I spelled kernel like a kernel of corn as opposed to an actual kernel. Thank you, Steve, I appreciate that. Um, sorry for that. All right, so if I switch back over to the Linux file system and I could do something like this, I could run explorer.exe, which is the Windows Explorer, except I'm running it on Linux. Linux will say, oh, this is not an ELF binary, it's fine, I'm gonna go and pop that out, give Windows a chance to look at that information, and then it's gonna pop up the Windows Explorer. Look at this. So I just ran the Windows Explorer from Linux, which is allowing me then to explore my Linux file system. And of course, the way that that's being done is through a tricky network. It's wsl.localhost, and we've got an actual Plan 9 server right there that um, is, uh, is giving us that ability. So this is pretty cool. All right, so here I can go and use my Windows Explorer to get my Linux file system. Uh, if I wanted to go and open up, you know, let's say, um, let's look at our hidden files here. Okay, let's look at my profile. If I said notepad.exe and brought up like my profile, we bring that up. We also updated notepad to support Unix line endings. So I'm able to do that. I can use whatever tool I choose to manage whatever I want to do. Isn't that nice? Okay, this is really important. This is why, to answer the question, I see a lot of questions down there where people are saying, well, why not just use a virtual machine? The idea being to be able to do these things side by side to blur the lines between tools and use the tool that makes you happy. So for example, if I hold down Alt here while I click on PowerShell, I'm gonna go and do a split screen. I've got Ubuntu on the left, I've got Windows PowerShell on the right. Do whatever I want to do. I can go and say explorer.exe or notepad like we saw. Now, here's where things get a little interesting. The WSL2 file system is opaque from the Windows side. I would have to access that by going into the, uh, the Windows Explorer. But here's where your brain's really going to explode. If you think that this is not your grandmother's uh, Windows, Linux is actually an option. There's a tux appearing inside of the Windows Explorer here. That's how tightly integrated that is. Uh, someone's saying that they'd like to see an architecture slide. Sure, I can make that happen for you. Let's go and do that. There's a discussion in the docs about the differences between uh, the WSL1 and WSL2 and specifically around file system perf. And there's a specific blog that I want to find that was written by a gentleman named Rich Turner that will give you your architectural stuff. Great questions coming in. There you go. I'll hold that up there while I look at some of these questions. Ah, great question from Bruno. This is brilliant. Okay, so let's make sure we talk about this because I know we're going fast and really there's like about an eight, eight, eight hours of presentation here and I'm trying to squish it into, uh, into one hour. Uh, SIGWIN would do the same thing, wouldn't it? Okay, on its face, it might seem like that, but let's remind ourselves what SIGWIN and MinGW and things like that are. SIGWIN is not Linux. Right? It's GNU user mode utilities that have been recompiled, recompiled against the Windows kernel. 
the Windows, right? Win.h, right? This is about, this is against Windows. So, see, you know, I got to spell kernel right because Steve's watching. So if I run SigWin, I'm running not bash, I'm running bash.exe, I'm running a, a, a portable C recompiled version of bash, I'm running ls.exe, I'm running grep. Dot exe. They're not ELF binaries, right? They're MX binaries. They're Windows binaries. So that's a great question. So SigWin, lovely tool that it is, gives you Bash on Windows. It gives you a Bashy like. It gives you a GNU tool, you know, toolkit. But it is not Linux. Well, WSL literally, literally gives you Linux on Windows. So you can't run a an ELF binary under SigWin. You can run your Bash scripts. Okay. Great question, great question. Now, additionally, let's see if there's a couple of other demos that I can do here. Laura, Laura Michaels has a great analogy here. Sigwin is a POSIX layer for Windows, right? MinGW is a native compiler. And then there's MIDI PIX, which is a better POSIX layer for Windows than Sigwin. So this is these are all great examples. Thank you, Laura, for that, uh, that clarity. All right. Here's something interesting, though. Here, I just ran the GIMP under Windows. And you can see the difference. Let's look at the difference between these two windows. Look at the Chrome, right? What we're doing here, is, I can show you the architecture diagram for this. This is actually running a Linux GUI app on Windows. You can get this now on Windows Insiders. This will be in Windows later this year. Uh, this is WSLG. And this is a very clever bit of architecture. And this is also up on GitHub as well. And I'll bring that up uh, in this tab right now. WSLG has a very clever architecture. Let's find that architecture diagram right here. And what it actually does is it's RDPing, it's remote desktoping seamlessly into a WSL specific system distro. This is Microsoft's Linux distro codenamed Mariner, and it's running free RDP. And we're doing a local remote desktop to it. And it'll support Wayland, it supports X11, it supports all kinds of apps, and it's got things like Pulse Audio built in. So I'm even able to go and run you know, emulators and games and stuff that are all Linux based under Windows, and it, it just works. Uh, and you can go and uh, see the relationship between the user distribution and then the, the WSLG system distribution. So what this meant is that I didn't have to set anything up. I didn't have to go and jump a bunch of hoops. All I had to do was install something like Xize using you know, apt-get, and then it shows up immediately. And what's even cooler is it shows up in the Windows start menu. So if you go and install Emacs, it's just going to appear in the start menu. And I can go and you know, sudo apt install Emacs. I don't already have it installed. I'll go ahead and grab that when I look at questions. Oh, Trevor Dolby from IBM being very kind to indicate that I am, in fact, doing this without any slides. Yeah, frazzled a bit, but not, uh, not a big fan of slides. I think that everything with a URL is better, and I don't think slides would actually make would actually add a lot of this. Ah, great question from Bill Katz saying, can WSL2 access the GPU? Absolutely. There's some really interesting discussions up on uh, this site. Uh, let me go and find you the WSL GPU blog as well that talks specifically about the architecture of WSLG. Microsoft's writing all of this stuff up. We want to make sure you're clear that nothing is a uh, a black box anymore. So we talk about the philosophy of this, building on Weston, and then specifically about the virtual GPU support. So yes, that is great. Um, Jared from Walt Disney is asking if it'll be available in Windows 10. Um, I believe that that is the case. Uh, if you want, we can actually check with Craig Llewellyn, who is the owner of WSL. Uh, right now, it works on Windows 10. I don't see any reason why they would go and take that away. Um, so, yeah, so this actually talks about the drivers that you need. And what's nice about GPU support being virtualized is that then PyTorch and all the different kinds of uh, ML loads that you could run all become available in this. And I was actually, actually, I think I did a blog post about this. If we go to Hanselman WSLG, uh, there we go. I wrote a blog post where I was running an emulator under WSLG. Here's what the start menu looks like. 
basically everything just gets a little tux next to his face. And you can pin these to yourself. So here's me running uh, a Wii, a Nintendo Wii emulator at 60 frames a second under WSL using my GPU. Okay, great questions here. Uh, Nuno, my buddy Nuno makes a great point here. If you wanna get into the details, uh, one of the things that Nuno is pointing out, he's an expert, Nuno De, uh, De Carmo is an expert on WSL and available on Twitter to ask and answer questions here. Talks about the launch configuration, specifically the uh, WSL conf file, which is a configuration that allows you to set memory. Oops. To set up memory. There you go. So here, right here, we've got a WSL config file that says, I'm going to limit the amount of memory and the number of processors on my uh, WSL, as well as if I want a custom Linux kernel of my own as well. You can use the inbox provided kernel or a, a custom Linux kernel that you have uh, created on yourself. Um, question here from Nishant is saying, is file system performance between WSL2 and native Linux? Uh, at the best of my knowledge and the best of my experience, it's within uh, single digit percentages as long as you're staying on the Linux file system. There is a considerable cross file system hit if you're on WSL and you're trying to talk to the Windows file system, then you're layering you know, file system on a file system, you're hitting two different file system drivers on one computer. So if you're doing native work on native Linux, you're doing great uh, and you'll have minimal, uh, minimal perf issues. Uh, again, Alexander is asking a question about the Linux kernel being swapped for another one. Absolutely, you can see right there, you can compile your own kernel uh, if it makes you happy. Um, oh, and this is great. So Stony Jackson's pointing out a question about Docker containers. It, Docker for Windows uses WSL. In fact, I've got blog posts about that. It's specifically set up where the back end is being done to use WSL. So when you run containers on Windows, WSL is the engine behind that. So yes, you should actually absolutely end up doing that, which is great. Yeah, this is a great point. Steve Burns pointing out that you could get some of this functionality running Docker containers. So in the old days, a couple of years ago, when you did this kind of stuff, you could, and people did, run the old version of Docker, Hyper-V, and then a Linux container, and then export their X servers, and they could cobble this stuff uh, together. Those days are over, and this is all integrated. So you don't have to do that, and you have fewer layers. So uh, great point there. Do Linux apps appear in the task manager, says, asks Mina. Great question. WSL1 Linux apps do. WSL2 Linux apps do not. They run in the context of this virtual machine, so they are opaque in the task manager. WSL1 doesn't use the Linux kernel, uses the Windows kernel, so they do appear in the task manager as what are called Pico processes. So you can see that, yeah. Uh, Moisha is saying uh, in VMware, you can share Windows folders to be used inside the Linux virtual machine. Uh, yeah, you can set custom mount points if you want and uh, use mount whatever. But as we do see a point here from, uh, from Doug Crozier, who's pointing out that the cross file system performance penalty is really the only problem. If you really need cross file system performance, specifically you need Linux, except you want it to talk to the Windows file system, you want to use the Windows drive. But let me talk about a thing that makes that actually easier, which is significant. Let's go over here, back over to Ubuntu, okay? We're on Home Scott, and I'm gonna go into a folder, which is my podcast. So this is my podcast, and it's written in .NET, which is cross-platform and, and open source. Just have C Sharp happens to be my my uh, drug of choice. And here I'm using .NET version 5, okay? And um, ah, great question from Robert Terzi who's saying, is uh, this a, uh, uh, an opaque ext4 file system in an in image file on NTFS? Yes, it is. In fact, it's a VHD. Okay, great question. So I'm here in my application. I'm going to type code dot. We saw how we could type notepad or explorer, but I'm going to type code. And watch for a moment. It says installing VS Code server. So on the server side, specifically on the Linux side, we just unpacked half of Visual Studio Code into a folder. Okay. But we launched Visual Studio Code 
in Windows. Okay, so, Win so Visual Studio Code in this context is a client server application. So this is not the X Windows version. This is not the Linux version of Visual Studio Code. This is the Windows version. Okay, and if I say file open file, notice that this is the Linux file system, the Linux file system. If I click show local, it's gonna pop open the Windows file system. You'll see that down here in the lower left corner, Visual Studio Code is acknowledging that this is in fact WCL and we're talking to Ubuntu. And what's happening is even if I open a terminal, look, I'm in a terminal in Ubuntu, there's HTOP, right? Do whatever I wanna do. What this means is that the Visual Studio Code server will be doing all of the language services. So for example, if I open up some of my C Sharp here, notice that I just got uh, some syntax highlighting there. If I go and make some space and start typing, notice that I'm getting IntelliSense, right? I'm getting IntelliSense and autocomplete. And when I do that and I hit, uh, I, I get do that IntelliSense, these pop-ups here are coming from the server side. They're running over here. So if I run HTOP, you can actually see, I think I made a poor choice of colors here. There's the GIMP. There you go. Here's VS Code server running in the background as a tiny local uh, uh, language server. Um, Carlos is asking a question. I want to avoid dual, dual booting because it's troublesome. Is WSL2 compatible with all Linux GUI-based apps? So far, I haven't had anything I haven't been able to run. If anyone has a suggestion on something, I can just do a quick uh, apt install. Uh, that would be fun. Let's actually go and do sudo apt install emacs as I was doing before. Bring that in. Have you two, WSL2 available for Windows Server? Not yet. Uh, this is primarily thought of as being a development tool because the acknowledgement is that people are developing on Windows for Linux containers for clouds that use Linux. So right now, uh, this is not a thing that is trying to replace Linux on the server. The intent would be if you want to run Linux on the server, run it on, uh, run it on the server. Um, Moisha is asking the great, the same Linux app would run quicker in WSL2 than in a Linux virtual machine or the opposite. That depends. In this context here, if you're running uh, with your GPU virtualized and you have an application that's using Wayland or using some uh, OpenGL or something, yes, very likely it will run faster under WSL2 because they have better GPU support. It really depends on uh, how good your virtualization tool is, whether you're using Hyper-V or trying to use uh, something like VMware or VirtualBox, but then remembering that the newer versions of VMware and VirtualBox actually build on Hyper-V. Um, Janice is pointing out they see all the Docker files are using Docker for Windows. How do I avoid Docker hanging in settings? I have not seen that, so let me run Docker desktop and see uh, what uh, Janice is talking about, and we'll see if we can figure that answer out here. Uh, is AIX or Solaris supported? No, right now everything is Linux-based. This is a Linux solution, so you can use any Linux distribution. And in fact, if I open up the Windows Store, and I go and run, you know, look for Linux. I can bring down any any Linux distribution. There are custom ones like W Linux, which is a great um, Linux distro that's specifically for um, uh, for Windows. There's Ubuntu. There's OpenSUSE. You know, all kinds of choices. So we can uh, run whatever makes us happy. Uh, but as, again, we have to be under Linux. Here's Emacs. Installed it. Ran it. Just ran. Not a problem. Do, 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 looking through the questions. Hemanth is saying that GPU drivers on NVIDIA have a lot of incompatibility. incompatibility. Windows NVIDIA GPU is a lot more stable. Uh, WSL will alleviate Linux and GPU issues. Theoretically, yeah, that's the idea, right? Right now, the Linux, uh, the, the GPU drivers on Windows are incredibly stable, should not be an issue. So, yeah, PyTorch, TensorFlow should work great. Can we use the Windows terminal to launch commands as admin with sudo? Right now, the there's no formal way. There is a tool that I can't recommend called gsudo that will let you do things as sudo, but I can run Windows terminal as admin and then I can launch things. 
Um, Bill Katz is saying, why, why would W Linux be better than Ubuntu? Better is a, uh, is, is objective, is subjective, pardon me. WSL by the, the Whitewater Foundry, I think it's called now Penguin Linux, Penguin with a W, I N is basically they've gone and taken like Fedora and they've added a bunch of settings and specific user um, user binaries that are things Windows people would like basically. So it's a Linux environment that was written given the fact that we know people would be on Windows. It's not a Microsoft thing. This is a third party. Um, it was basically the first Linux distro that was created specifically for WSL. So if you love Ubuntu, use Ubuntu. And the great part is that you can use as many of these as you want. That's what's so cool about this. You don't have to pick one. I can run N number of these side by side. You don't have to pick one. Absolutely use the one that makes you happy. You can install Alpine. You can install your own. It doesn't matter. Uh, can you run ML models with CUDA? Sure, absolutely. Um, oh, uh, one other thing that's really helpful. I use tail scale. Some of the problems, some some issues with um, uh, with WSL and networking are a little bit confusing. And I use tail scale to flatten my network into a mesh. And I've got a blog post about that as well. So if you go and search for Hanselman tail scale, based on WireGuard. And that allows me to run services on WSL and then on my iPhone or my Android device, go and test my, my websites directly under there. Oh, this is a great point from Paul Fisher, and I really love this point. Uh, can Windows batch files reference Linux command tools? Yes. There's, there's actually two questions here that Paul's asking. They say, can a Windows batch file reference Linux command line tools? You can, from within something like PowerShell, I could go and say, DIR and then pipe it through, this is DIR in Windows, piping it through Linux, through grep, and then pipe that through more in Windows. So I can go back and forth and in between and do all kinds of things, so absolutely. But then you say, Paul, can you reference Linux command line tools like SSH? You can, but it's worth pointing out that SSH uh, already exists on Windows I always forget if it's which SSH. Oh, sorry, SSH, not SSL. There's which, and then there's where. I always get my operating systems confused. There you go. Open SSH is shipped with Windows for a number of years. Uh, so you can SSH on Windows now. The other thing that you can note is that you don't have to use PuTTY anymore if you just SSH from here. Uh, so there's no need to have your students install PuTTY. What hardware support does WSL2 use to make it so efficient? What is the process? How does the process segregate the two OSs? It's using the VT extensions and the virtual extensions that have been available on processors for many years. So it's using Hyper-V and virtualization. So they are virtu completely virtualized processes. Um, Robert Terzi is asking about e external devices on other file system. What's the best way? No, path no pass through USB yet that I know about. Uh, but Plan 9 server does allow access uh, from Windows. Um, Candy's asking, is there a way to drop the existing VM and start a new one? Yeah, absolutely. Like you can go in here and WSL dash dash list dash V. And I could go and delete this one. I can add as many as I want. I can export it, start over, and absolutely uh, do it, do anything I want. Someone's asking me to run Xterm sudo apt install xterm. Oop. While I'm doing that, can I install pymol? Okay, I can do that too. Aren't we having fun here, my friends? Can you set up a cluster of WSL2? Yeah, you could do them on multiple machines and flatten the network with uh, tail scale. You could run multiple instances side by side. Absolutely happy to do that. Um, can you update a Linux distro? Yeah, I can WSL, I can apt get um, update and upgrade. So I've updated my Ubuntu uh, from uh, 18 to 20 without having to reinstall anything. Uh, someone's asking for Xterm. Xterm started up missing a font, but there's Xterm. So yeah, I mean, that's that's a thing. And then someone else wanted Pymol. Oops. That's not PMOL, PYMOL, PYMOL. 
I'll grab that. We have some application code. Want to check portability issues on Linux? Can you use SWSL for this? Absolutely. Can you run Windows GUI apps that use the Linux file system? They would have to be written in a client server way, like the example that we use um, before. I like Tortoise Git. I would try to use find a Git client on Linux rather than using uh, trying to do cross stuff. Yeah, uh, Paul Fisher's pointing out that Windows is SSH definitely lags behind like Netcat. So yeah, you would definitely. If you want the latest stuff, you're going to want to stay in Linux. So great stuff. I'm sorry that we did run out of time. I would like to thank you very much, Scott. This was a very informative, great presentation, taking lots of wonderful uh, questions from folks. You had very insightful answers. To We had a couple hundred questions. So obviously, folks are very engaged and interested in what it is that you had to say. Yeah, here we see also Pymol. Didn't didn't yeah. plan this. Totally live demo works just great. So thanks for all yep. the wonderful questions. And follow me on Twitter if you have more questions, my friends. So again, special thanks to each of you for taking the time to attend and participate today. Um, we do appreciate you folks participating in the ACM um, Tech Talks that we have. Mm -hmm. This Tech Talk was recorded and will be available online in a few days at learning.acm.org. You can also find announce announcements and upcoming talks and other ACM activities at learning.acm.org and also on acm.org. Also, when this is done, please take time to fill out our quick survey where you can suggest both future topics for speakers and you can give us feedback on um, this current one and that'll pop up on your screen. So again, on behalf of ACM, Scott Hanselman and myself, Dr. Jensen, I would like to take, thank you all again for joining us and I hope you in, will join us again in the future. And this concludes the Tech Talk today. Thank you very much.